But you can um, <laughs> fix that. Fix my defective cheerfulness. The sound man is occupied. <laughs> cold, wet to come and worship God today. Let's take a second and do that and just sing his praises this morning. Y'all stand. We're going to sing to God be the glory. Thank you. 
Telling you. Speech. It's going to be tough here in a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> this uh, particular scripture was written for Christians and if you are a Christian uh, think of these words that I'm going to read after our profession of faith in Jesus Christ we are burdened to grow as Christians so that we can lead others to the saving grace of God. And if you're not in a Sunday school class, it'd be a great beginning for you and me <laughs> uh, to uh, Enroll. <laughs> Enroll is just being there. Think of these words as, as we read. It's found in Second Peter chapter one verses five through ten. There's some uh, words in the scriptures that uh, we need to grasp a hold of. Listen as I read. And besides this, what the world has to offer, give diligence. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure for if you do these things, you shall never fall. That's reading five verses. And the words I'm particularly interested in is virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, and kindness. <laughs> All these apply to us as Christians, Amen. and we should use them in our daily life. Mm -hmm. This is not right. just when you were saved, but it continues from that point unto death. Mm -hmm. We can grasp each of these to <coughs> make us to grow in Christ, Amen. Amen. that others may come to know him as their savior. The thing is, of, of it is, we need to be sure that God has reached down and touched our hearts with virtue. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come in your holy name thanking you, God, that Peter recorded these words 
for young Christians in that day, but also for us today, Lord, as we become children of God. Amen. Thank you, God, that you left these words for us to grow. We pray for those in the war. Lord, we know that that they need your help. Help us all, Lord, to grow in these words each day. For it is in Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. 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 What a wonderful day it is. We've been blessed to be in the Lord's house. It's good to see all of y'all. Good to see Roger too. We like to pick on Roger. (laughs) Got a card addressed to the church. I want to read you this morning. Says you're wonderful. I'm so thankful for all the warmth, care, and love that God put in your heart. It says, and the beautiful gifts of having you in my life. It says, thank the church for the gift. Loving Christ, Joan Christie Weinberg. We really appreciate them. Glad to see y'all here. and Some of that equipment off of your shoulder. We thought he was the bionic man there for a while, so, but now we're glad we're glad they're doing doing better. March will be here before we know it. Yeah, where did January go? Yeah, you know, wow, time moves on. This month coming up, we've got a lot of special things going on. Got a birthday. Yeah, another another trip around the the sun for Rick. <laughs> going to have on the thirteenth. We're going to have Deacons Day. Each of the Deacons are going to uh, present on that day. So uh, first time we've ever done that. Solos. Oh. I hadn't heard that yet, so I'm glad I'm not on that committee. So. I will be here. I <laughs> uh, look forward to that. Also, uh, little ladies Bible study every last Saturday throughout this year. Last Saturday in each month. Let me rephrase that. Last Saturday in each month from. Okay, so you may have to switch the. Okay, it'll at least be once a month. From 9 to noon. Looked like you had a good good crowd yesterday. Yeah. That is good. In the last Sunday of this month, there's going to be a ride in. What are we riding in on? Anything you want. <laughs> Not I got you. Or the same thing we rode in this morning on? Weed eaters. <laughs> Hobby horses. That'll be the last Sunday of every month will be a riding Sunday. Okay. And last we'll Sunday of every month. A ride and, and afterwards to go somewhere to eat. Oh, okay. Cool. Tell some, tell some people about Jesus. I know, uh, I know I'm looking forward to warm weather. Yeah. And you know what warm weather brings? Mowing. Mowing. <laughs> and then it doesn't stop till Thanksgiving, so, uh, you know. 
But you know, the Lord blesses us with these different seasons for a reason. So it all works together. Have we got any announcements from anyone else? March the 20th, my birthday celebration. Service oh, I'm sorry. I didn't elaborate on on that. Yes. On the more this week. They, they've actually been, this, the, the, you know, the COVID thing, they've actually been inundated. They are, uh, they did 55 concerts last year. Wow. And it uh, and, uh, looked like they're going to do it's that much and, and maybe more this year. So they're looking forward to being here, of course. And, oh, cool. And we'll be having a fellowship meal afterwards and, and just uh, kind of celebrate. So this is going to be on the 20th. Right. Actually, Rick's going to be 17 on the 17th, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. We'll have a we'll have a meal after that. We look forward to seeing servants' voices. Um, they're almost like family. Yeah. So uh, we're glad we're glad they're able to come. Anything else? Pray for Ronnie's father, Reverend James Moore. Uh, he he's he's uh, 83 years old, and his health is. He's really having a bout right now, and uh, he, he asked us to pray for him. Reverend James Moore. Well, if nothing else, we'll turn it back over to Miss April. take the offering and Jesus change. Amen. So y'all stand and uh, sing out on this one and take the opportunity to give back today. I know who holds tomorrow. Amen. <coughs>
dear, especially Heavenly Father. Give Father, just thank you for this day, Lord. Lord, I thank you for everything you give me, Dad, for today. But most of all, thank you for coming and dying on the cross for my yes. sins, Lord. Lord, just ask your day be with all the people that's here, Lord. But most of all, be with all the ones of them that's not here. Amen. Especially the ones that didn't want to come out, Lord. Just be yes. them and touch them and bring them back, Lord. Lord, today I ask you just to be with the, all the people that need you, Lord. Be with the Ukrainian people. Be with the yes. people that's fighting the war, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, I just ask you today, just be with the preacher, Lord. Bring yes, a message Father, from you to yes. From you through him, I touch all the hearts, Lord. Someone here today don't know your Savior. Maybe yeah. they will be today. They will come to know you, Lord. Lord, I ask you, please use this money and uprise of your kingdom. In Jesus' precious name I ask. Amen. 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 Good morning. I'm going to share a song real quick, if you guys don't mind. Uh, just pray for me. I've had this song on my heart for a, a little while and just got to the point where I perfected it, hopefully. But um, just pray for me. And I hope it's a blessing for y'all. Above the 
for I am yours, and you are mine. Amen. Good job. I was enjoying that. Ready for some more. Amen. Good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful to God's challenge to be in his house. And we appreciate you being here. You've got a good group here today. We've got some people out. I, I think a, 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 few of, a few of us saw snowflakes. I told my wife when we were coming, we seen a little snowflakes on the windshield. I said, oh. I said, hope some of them Baptists don't see that. And uh, some of them I think did. But I understand that. We need to be careful. I don't want, old, I don't want folks uh, out uh, traveling that... Uh, some of you can't, can't drive very good anyway, and, and the snow doesn't help. So uh, we want you to be, to be careful. And, and, uh, but a good crowd here this morning, and uh, hopefully we've got them joining in there uh, uh, by Facebook. And just a, just a delight to be in the house of the Lord. What a privilege is to know Jesus. Amen. You realize how blessed we are? Amen. Oh, man, I tell you what. I, 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 just, I just look back at our church, and we're going through tough times. We're sicknesses, diseases, problems. Uh, you know, hey, we we seen a major uh, conflict break out with Europe, and but you know, I, I remember something that I believe it was uh, General MacArthur that uh, told his commanders one time. His captains he had a meeting with them. He said one of the mistakes we make, uh, as far as our armies are concerned, and one of our and and when we're fighting battles, this thing is we don't stop to count our victories. And uh, said, well, all the time we're always focused on the losses. Yeah. And uh, he would make it a point to always talk about the victories before he talked about the losses. Sure. And, uh, you know, that's, I, I think that's uh, sometimes as Christians and Christian churches and organizations, we, we're guilty of that. Uh, we, we are so concerned about the problems. And we need to be, don't get me wrong, uh, ignoring a problem doesn't fix it. Uh, I used to have a boss man that used to tell me that uh, uh, problems don't get better with age, okay? Uh, they just get worse. And, uh, but uh, we need to look at our victories. I see people's lives changing. I see people growing in our, in our church. Uh, Whitney's a great example of this. I don't want you to get a big head about this now. But, <laughs> but uh, I've seen her grow up in this church and, and uh, going to singing in the choir and leading the music. And that's awesome. Amen. That's spiritual growth. I, I was out uh, riding one day. A, a group of us was riding one day. We went to a popular secular biker place and and uh, I saw a man in his church I won't call his name but I saw a man in his church as we got off and started milling around some of the bikers I saw him walk up to a hell's angel I'm not sure he even knew he was a hell's angel because he wasn't wearing colors at that particular time but I knew him and I knew his name and knew who he was and I saw him give him a track yeah. and man I just busted with pride yeah. said, man that is strong I see, I see it in all of you. I, I listen, God, uh, we're, we're, we're gaining. We're getting victories. And the, and the victories, sometimes the victories are the small little things that, uh, as far as the world is concerned. But we look and see how God is working in people's lives and they're growing. And they're beginning to do things that they've never done before. Awesome. I mean, that's, that's awesome. So I just thank the Lord. Uh, for his many blessings and how he's working in our lives. And of course we want more. And of course we want to deal with the, the problems. Of course we want to deal with our shortcomings. But let's be sure to stop and count the victories. Amen. And not, we gotta, we gotta guard ourselves from being just too negative. We've gotta be positive about these things. Well, anyway, turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 32. We're gonna take a little detour. I, I think, uh, uh, God was speaking to April about uh, uh, the change in the message today. I was going to preach on something else, but God really changed my mind on it this week and, and the last, actually the last few days. And, uh, you know, we, we've been inundated. The, the, I, I know uh, the other day when uh, the Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia invaded the Ukraine, I was kind of mesmerized by that and spent a lot of time watching it. And it's, and it's a, a very important event. And we need to pray for our Ukrainian brethren. Amen. We have a lot of Ukraine, we have a lot of brethren, b b Christians uh, in the Ukraine. Amen. 
And I've seen a lot of pictures on the internet. Uh, I, I posted one on our, our North Beaver website or our North Beaver Facebook site about some Christian bikers uh, in the Ukraine. And, and they're a very, let me put it this way, they're a very American European uh, 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 empire or, or nation. And that, that's good in some ways, good in not, but we, there is a strong Christian presence there. And we need to be praying for them. And uh, we need to be praying for that whole situation that God will intervene. But we've been inundated with that today. We've had a lot of things on our mind. And uh, the, the thing that, that when these things happen, we have a tendency to say, well, who's in charge? Is anybody driving this bus, you know? I, I, I've often said and used that as an illustration, when you're going down, a, going, down a, going down a mountain at 85 miles an hour to the back of the bus, you might need to walk up front and see if there's a driver. Uh, may not be with nobody driving that thing. And, uh, but we know who's in charge. We know who's in control. And we know, as we sang, uh, who we need to give the glory to. And uh, we know who our God is. It's, it's, it's important to know the little things. I was telling my wife this morning that I was getting ready for church. And, and I got up and, and uh, washed my hair and combed my face. And, and uh, got that going. And uh, I was in there. And have you ever, ever, you ever just done something just, and it just happened? Well, a little thing happened to me this morning, and it shows you how important it is uh, to remember who, who or what something is. So I, I was in there standing in front of the mirror, which is all, always a traumatic experience for me anyway, and uh, I, grabbed a, I grabbed a spray can, and I, I like these spray can things of deodorant and soap and different things. I, I'm, I, it just takes too much time rubbing your hands together with soap. But I grabbed a can, I was, you know, I, I was, I was time to, to put my deodorant on. And I use it, by the way. And uh, so I, I, I grabbed it up and sprayed it. I thought, well, that doesn't feel right. That feels different than it felt yesterday. And I went and took my hand and stuck it up under my armpit and I had sprayed shave gel under that. <laughs> and uh, it smelled all right, but it was a little gooey. And uh, so, I, and I began to compare, and my, my deodorant spray can was just about the same color, so I, I kind of tried to maybe do something with that. But, you know, that, that, that's a, that gives you a weird, funky feeling in the morning, you know. And, uh, but it, it's important to know what you're doing and know who, what's going on. I, and that's kind of uh, kind of what we're going to look at today in the Exodus chapter 32. Uh, we're going to talk about... We're going to talk about, uh, you know, I thought about a subject for this. It's really self-explanatory. Uh, Israel forgot who their God was. Amen. And that's a dangerous thing to do. Uh, you know, we need to remember who our God is and what he can do, and, and especially what he has done. And so we're going to look at Exodus chapter 32 this morning. I'm going to read about, I think I read about 14 verses this morning. And we're going to look at uh, uh, an event in the life of Israel there. Now, let me get, kind of give you a context of where we're at. They've uh, come across, they've come out of Egypt and uh, gone across the, you know, the, the uh, Red Sea and been delivered and all that, and Moses and holding the, you know, the waters divided and everything. So they're over in the land. And uh, uh, Moses has gone up uh, onto the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And it takes a little bit longer for him to do that than they like. You know, God has a timetable and we have a timetable. And I, I'm, I'll tell you that they rarely run together. Either we're way behind him or he's way ahead of us or we're way ahead of him. And, and we want God, you know... Uh, uh, it's like that. It's like that old saying that says, "God, give me patience and give it to me right now." Yeah. You know, we 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 live in an instant society where we go into a restaurant that promises a a hamburger in a minute, and if it takes fifty nine seconds, we get mad. You know, we're just so instant about everything, and we're not willing to wait and to and to see and 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 wait on God. So in Exodus chapter 32, beginning verse 1, we're going to begin reading. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the key word there is delayed. 
And when he delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, what was their, what was their way of dealing with their impatience? Uh, what, were their way, what was their way of dealing with the fact that God wasn't doing what, uh, acting like they thought God would act like and, or should be acting like? They said, they told Aaron, said, uh, they brought, brought all the people together and got to Aaron and said, come get up before us for as this Moses, the man has brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. But what we want you to do, he said there in verse, uh, in verses one and two, he said, I want to, they, they want, make us a God. Make us gods. We need some gods to worship. We need, this is a situation, we, we, we need something to look to. We need something to believe in. We need something to grab hold of. We need to, believe, we need to have something to believe that it's going to get us through this. They said, make us, make us some gods. So we're talking about homemade gods today. What, do, what is a homemade god? Why do we make them up? And, and how do we make them up? And, and, and what are some of them? So it goes on in verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives or your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me. I want to stop right here just a minute because there's an important question that we're going to deal with here in just a minute and you might miss this if you don't. He tells a bunch of former slaves, break off the golden earrings in your ears. Where in the world did they get golden earrings? I mean, gold was as distant to the life of a slave than anything there was. They, the slaves just didn't have gold. And what it reminds us is this. Everything they had was called, because of God's provision, when they came out of the land of Egypt, what did he cause the Egyptians to do? To pay them a spoil. They were so sick. The Egyptians were so sick of the plagues of God and so finally got so sick of God's people being there and, and what, what, it was, what was uh, happening to their nation. They said, we'll, we'll not only want you to go, we will, we will pay you to go. Now, buddy, you really, you really know you're getting on somebody's nerves when, they, nerves when they offer to pay you to leave. Well, that's what happened. That's where they got these golden earrings and that's going to be important here in a minute. But he goes on and in verse 3 he says, uh, he says in verse 4, he said, and receive them at their, and he received them at their hand. And here's another key word, fashioned it. Mm -hmm. The Bible says over and over again that God fashioned the world. What does that mean? God had a vision. You know what fashion is? You ladies especially, I say the word fashion, and I've seen their ears go, bring, you know, hey, he's saying, he's talking my language now, okay? Uh, fashion means that, that a designer has a vision of what something ought to be. Well, these people had a design in their mind of what God ought to be. Okay? That's why that word is so important. So he began to fashion it with a graving tool, and after he had made it a molten calf, and they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, wait a minute, Aaron. That's not the God that brought them out of Egypt. That's right. That's, right. that's not right. Mm -hmm. that's, fall, that's, that's bad preaching there. That's, fall, that's false prophecy right there. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, but that's what he said. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And anytime you, anytime you, dream, up a, anytime you dream up a false God, and you have a homemade God, you're going to put up an altar pretty soon. Before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, "Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord." So we're gonna have a we're gonna have a big party tomorrow. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt sacrifices or burnt uh, uh, burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and to rose up to play. That word "play" there is very important as well because this just isn't normal play. This is bad play. This is play that involves drinking and, and uh, lewd behavior and other things. This is not going to be a God party. This is going to be a their party. They may say, oh, we're going to worship God. We're going to worship this God. But this God, you know what this God's going to do? This God's going to let us do, indulge our own desires. 
That's one of the reasons people don't like God. That's one of the reasons people don't come to church. I, I witness to people all the time. Yesterday morning, I got out driving around. I, uh, I was headed out uh, toward Warrensville, and the thought came to my mind. I, 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 I just, that early that early that morning, when I talked to God. I said, "You know, God, I want to. I want to. This this thing of uh, Ukraine war and COVID and all this other stuff. I want to know that I can make a difference in one person's life today." I, I'd, I'd actually uh, saw one of those uh, videos there on YouTube. There's a guy on there, there's several guys on there that go around town in the towns that they're in and they mow people's yards. They see a yard really growed up and they say, well, that person can't mow their yard. And they'll stop and offer to mow their yard. This one guy's name is Al Blades. And I've listened to him and it's just interesting. I tell you what, you know, you know you've got older when you sit for an hour and watch somebody mow a yard. I don't know why. Well, is that not fascinating? And and they cut, you know, they clean it up and makes it, and it makes you just, you're, it brings you satisfaction. Like, oh man, it looks so much better. But he'll go around and he knocked on this one man's door and said, uh, "I see your yards grow up." And he said, "Evidently, you can't." He said, "I want to mow your yard for." Him. The guy said, "I have no money." He said, "That's all right. I'm gonna do it for free." The guy said, "I have no money." He said, "No, you don't understand. I'm not gonna charge you anything. I don't have no money." And finally, he got it through the guy that, hey, I'm not going to charge you. He did it for free. Well, I thought if this secular guy who's going around mowing yards for people can make a difference in someone's life, surely, surely he knows the, someone who knows the Lord and claims to be a Christian can do that. And I thought, well, how can I do that? It was drizzling rain and cold and everything. And I came around a corner there, uh, came around a curve there on 88, and here was a guy walking toward me with a gas can. Now, I'm a pretty sharp guy. The first thing I thought was, that guy's bringing me a gift of gasoline. Okay. But that, I said, no, that's not a good thought. I said, the second thought is, that guy has run out of gas. Sure enough, I went around the next corner, and there was his truck. I immediately whipped around, drove back, pulled up beside him, and said, can I give you a ride to the gas station? And the first thing who, me? You know, yeah, you're the only one out here with a, you know. And uh, he came and got in the car. I, I opened the trunk. He put the gas can in there. He, young guy, I, he was, uh, you know, dressed okay. He was, a little, he was a little rough, and his truck was a little rough. And, and, uh, and uh, when he got in, I said, now, first thing I want you to know is I'm not weird. And this is not, that's nothing strange. He said, I just... I just seen you and God told me to, uh, you know, I said, I mentioned, well, I mentioned God, uh, that makes, you probably think I'm weird now. I said, uh, God told me to stop and pick you up and take you to the gas station. It was about a half a mile up, so we turned around and went to the gas station. And I went in and got me a drink, and while I was in there, I paid for his gas. I didn't, I didn't do that to get that off thing, but thank you very much, I appreciate that. <laughs> that felt good. <clears throat> but I paid for his gas. And when he, he went in, I came out, and he, and he came back, and he said, that lady in there said that you paid for the gas. And I said, yeah, I did. He said, that's weird. <laughs> he said, it's weird that you would stop and give me a ride and then pay for my gas, too. Amen. And I said, you know what? It is weird, and I'll tell you why. And why, and why I'm weird. I said, one day I met a man. Yeah. Amen. Name Jesus. Amen. 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 I was run out of gas on the side of the road of life, and he took me to the gas station, Amen. filled up my can, and paid the price. Yeah. And I'm just paying it back. And I got an opportunity to witness to him and put the gas in the truck, and he went on his way. And I didn't tell you that to tell you that and get glory from me but I just I want to give glory to God Amen. because that, that you know I don't know maybe maybe I don't know it made, it made a difference in my life but I hope it made a difference in his yes. but anyway Israel has come out of Egypt and now you know God's not doing what he's they think God ought to be doing. He's not acting the way they, they think he ought to be acting. Uh, and they said, we're going to fashion a God. We're going to make a God that fits into our lifestyle. That's what a homemade God is. Right? Yeah. I've got homemade things. I've got things that uh, 
that I use as tools, that I use as implements, that I use as things around my house. You couldn't use. Why? Because they're made for me. They're made by my fashion. I know what they can do. They're made to suit me. Well, that's what a homemade God is. So he said, we're making a homemade God. And he said, these be thy gods. And Moses, uh, then he said in verse 9, and the Lord said unto Moses, he, remember Moses is up on a mountain, and he's meeting with God. And he says, tell, Moses said, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. It, you know, we know what stiff neck is? I'm going to do it my way, and I don't care what anybody else says or what God says. That's stiff-neckedness. All I can say to you stiff-necked people is, you do it your way, you deal with your consequences. These be your gods. Moses said these are stiff-necked people. He said, now there in 4 verse 10, let me alone for my wrath may wax hot against them that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great name. I'll just take you. Now, when you get to the point where God says, it's my wrath, you're, you're at the end you ever, you ever seen those little old things? Uh, you're on you're on my last nerve, little thing. You know, I seen a little thing on a, somebody's desk one time. I said, uh, you know, you're on my last nerve. I ooh, I don't watch that person. So, but that's what God when God gets to that point, He said, I've dealt with you and I've dealt with you and I've dealt with you. You've disobeyed me. You've rebelled against me. You you've tried to live your own life. You told me not to bother you. All these other things, and now uh, you know you've done this. I'm at the point, I'm getting ready, just like it was with Noah. It's repented me. Matter of fact, he goes on and says, uh, look down at verse 12, the last part. Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of God. Uh, Moses said, man, won't you change your mind again? God's at the point, he said, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with these people. I, I've got a different, I've got a plan B. I don't have to work with you, Israel. That's what he said when he told Matt, when he told Moses. He said, I'll make of thee a great name. That's my plan B. If you won't obey, if you won't listen, if you won't be a part of what I, the plan I have for your life, I'll go somewhere else. Believe me, you're not God's gift to his plans. God wants to work with you. He loves you. He died for you. But he's got a second plan. So he goes on in verse 13. He says, Moses says, now remember God, and, and here's how he got God. You, you want to see a man get God? You know how you get God? You remind him of his promises. He said, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and said unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And look what it says, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto this people. You can get God by reminding him of his promises. That's the only way you can get him. Well, what I want to talk to you this morning real quickly, I'm going to give you five things. First of all, about these homemade gods. And there, remember what a homemade god is? It's a god we fashioned, designed to fit our desires. It's a god who's going to do what we want to do, act like we think he ought to act, when we want him to act that way. So first of all, a homemade god comes many times... It, 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 the, the birthplace of a homemade God is when we forget what the real God has done. All through, all through the time that the nation of Israel was wandering in the wilderness, uh, God's man Moses and Joshua later on, whatever, they were constantly reminding people, God's been with you. God's blessed you. God's helped you. You remember the Dead Sea? They even had a song about the Dead Sea when they come. What, they sang a song as they come across the way. You know how you can remember an event? By a song. You know, I, I remember years ago there was a great ship that sank on the uh, Lake Michigan called the Edmund Fitzgerald. You know how I remember that? I remember the song. 
Some guy wrote a song about it, and that got stuck in my head. I mean, it's just one hit wonder, but it just sticks in my head. Well, they sang a song. They've got that song, jo Joshua, when they came across the, uh, came across the uh, uh, Jordan River, and God parted the waters. They set up, they set up a memorial. They did kept doing things over and over. And that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons God said, when He got them over to the mount, He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to uh, have this, this, feast and this observance and this sacrifice and this are remember all those things over in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and all that well why in the world did they have all that to constantly be reminding God's people that God is real God is powerful God loved them and he helped them in their time of need Amen. God did not fail and does not fail Amen. and sometimes we forget that Bless them. That's why preachers today constantly are, are at you about read your Bible, pray, study, do all well, you know, do everything you can. Why? To constantly remind ourselves. Because yeah. we're forgetful. Especially when it comes to remember how God has delivered us in the past. So it, when when we forget what God has done. That's an opportunity for the devil to step in and begin to say, well, you know, that's what he did in the garden. He said, well, you know, really? Did God do that? He didn't really do that, did he? Yeah, he did. And we did remember. Because as long as we remember that, we will constantly be rehearsing in our mind that God has been there in my past. God will be around in my future. He didn't let me down then. He will not be let me down now. Amen. We don't need a, another God if the God you've got's working. And our God is working. Amen. Second of all, when God, when, when we can't, we don't understand, or, or when we think God is not working fast enough, that's an opportunity for us to make us a homemade God. See, Moses went up on the mountain and it was a part of God's plan. He had to go get the, the uh, tablets, the Ten Commandments. He was going to go up there and meet with God. And what a wonderful thing that was, an opportunity for him. And uh, they were waiting there. And it probably took a couple of weeks. Well, they got impatient. What is it about human beings and impatience? We just, we just can't wait on God. We just can't wait on anything. I, I'm, I'm amazed, and, and I'm talking about myself. I get impatient. I mean, I pull up uh, to a stoplight, and there's, there's a, a car there, and, and the light turns green, and I'm ready for a burnout. <laughs> you know, let's go. Zero to sixty. You know what's my what's my reaction time? What's my lap speed? You know from that light to this light. But un unfortunately, Grandma Moses is in front of me, and and of course she's at a she's at a, a, a protected light, and there's nothing coming, and but she's got to look, and then she checks the bag. You know, okay, is anybody behind me? Anybody to the side? And finally, I see her brake lights go off. And I say, oh, we're going to start moving. And all of a sudden, they come back on again. <laughs> and we start to inch, excruciatingly inching across the, across the uh, road there. And I'm about to go berserk. We are so impatient. And that transfers over into our, our relationship with God and how we deal with Him and don't understand. We all, we, we've got these visions and dreams and ideas of what we want to do and we want to see happen in our lives. We want to, we want to achieve and grow and there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got to wait on God. Amen. God's plan is God's plan. Amen. And, and part of waiting on God, first of all, test our faith. You know, if I, if I, if God waits or delays, or remember when Mo, when uh, Jesus, uh, they came and told him that Lazarus had died or was sick. They first told him he was sick, and what did he do? Oh, he just stopped what he was doing right there and just rushed off over to Bethany. No, he waited four days. The disciples are going bananas. Wait a minute. When are we going to go deal with the... Uh, you don't understand. We've got to get over there. We've got to... And by the time they finally got there, he was what? Dead. Not only dead, but buried. 
And then the, the first thing that, that uh, I believe it was Mary said, if you had only been here, if your plans and your timetable had run like I wanted to run, you would have been able to save him. You see, what Mary didn't understand was this. God wanted to do something even better than, than the healing. Yeah. He wanted to resurrect him. Yeah. He needed a dead Lazarus to work with. Amen. Listen, sometimes when God delays what he does in your life, he's just waiting to do something greater. Amen. He's got something far more wonderful to do in your life. But many times we want to say, well, God, come on now, let's get with it. And God said, wait. And we said, come on, let's get with it. Wait. You know, wait for it. Man, what a glorious thing it was when, rat, when Lazarus came out of that grave. Amen. Wow. Amen. Not only healed, no doubt in his mind. Listen, if, if we had went back there and he'd have got healed, that would have been great and wonderful. If we'd have went back there and, you know, well, they could say, well, it was just a natural process of him getting healed and getting better. It wasn't really a God act. But when he went back there and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth hopping out of that grave with wrapped around the grave clothes. Man, there wasn't no doubt who Jesus was. Amen. He was God. Amen. You see, what, what God many times is waiting to do is to do such a God thing in you that it will prove to others that God's power is real. Amen. When we have to wait on God, Sometimes we get the idea we need to fashion another God that will go by our time clock. Number three, when we believe that other gods can do even better. You know, the world's out there saying, oh, man, I don't know what it is about early in the morning. But early in the morning is the time, now I know we don't, we, our television situation is different now. We don't get a lot of the main networks and stuff, and that's okay. But it used to be about, from about five to six maybe, it was all infomercials. You know what an infomercial is. It's a whole program dedicated to a commercial. What could be worse? You know, not a, not a 30 second commercial in a movie, a whole 30 minute commercial. And it was interesting, I was watching one morning, I turned to one channel, and a guy there said, this will grow hair, which was very interesting to me. <laughs> I turned to another channel, lose weight. Turned to another channel uh, for ladies, oh, give your hair volume. I said, well, I gotta get the hair first before I get volume. <laughs> huh? Then it was this car warranty and uh, make your feet smell better. And I mean, it was over and over and over. Every channel was infomercial. And they were making promises. Yes. We live in a world today where our false gods and the gods we make make a lot of promises. The things we worship, I, I kind of made a little list here, and it's not, not a comprehensive list, but I think these are the major things we got to uh, Let me share this with you right quick. First of all, wealth, possessions, and things is our number one false god. Right. Our homemade god. If I can just, how many of our times have I heard it? How many times have I said it? If I could just win the lottery, I would be happy. Well, why am I not happy now? I got a God who loves me and saved me from hell. He is with me every day. He's going to take me to heaven someday. Is that not making me happy? But that other false God who are saying, oh, but wealth, oh, but possessions, oh, but things. They make all kinds of promises. Jude talked about it in the first chapter of Jude. You ever read the first chapter of Jude? That's the only chapter. But he said the false gods of the latter days are clouds without water. You see a cloud? We see a big cloud on the end sky over here. Oh, it's been dry. It's been hot. It's a, it's almost almost a drought. Here's a big cloud, and then it passes over and it doesn't rain. That's what a false god does. It promises, but it doesn't deliver. That's right. Wealth, possessions, and things is a false god that we turn to many times to say, that's, gonna, what, that's what's going to make me happy, and, and that's the god I want. Second of all, power, control, and authority. The illusion of us controlling our lives 
is a dangerous idol. Even, even if you think you're in control, you're not. Because one thing God can allow can take away that control. Amen. You can think I have everything going on. I got money. I got wealth. I got power. I got strength. Uh, I got. I got. You know. I, uh, everybody's kin to me is pretty. Everybody smells good. I just got it all. One doctor's report can change it forever. Amen. It's an illusion of control in this world. Nobody controls anything in this world but God. Number two, number three, excuse me. One, three, seven, okay. Number three. Physical beauty, sensualness, and sex. We are inundated with that. We, we, that's why I say all those infomercials about look better, smell better, be better. You know, it's all, that's what it's all about. We've got to look a certain way. We've got to feel a certain way. Uh, you know, it's all about the flesh. Listen, we need to understand, folks, you can be the most beautiful person in the world. And I, I'm, not, I'm not against that. You know, comb your hair, take a bath. <laughs> use your powders, use your things. You know, this guy, like the guy said, paint the barn. <laughs> but it ain't going to change what's in the barn. That's right. That's right. Outside is temporary. But we have people today that that's all that matters. That's why people pay $50,000 for a makeover. That's why pay, people pay $50,000 for a dress. That's why men go to spa. Man, why don't a man go to a spa? <laughs> For goodness sake, go to the racetrack. I mean, go somewhere. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? We spend billions of dollars. Actually, the United States of America economy spends more money on personal hygiene and those type of things than our defense budget. Let that sink in. Number four. Education, wisdom, worldly wisdom, and worldly knowledge. I'm not against education. Not at all. I believe that. Listen, listen, stupidity. God doesn't put a premium on stupidity or ignorance. But we need to understand worldly wisdom against godly wisdom, worldly knowledge against God's knowledge, all those things. Those things, you know, oh man, my, my head, I'm, I'm, I'm like a wall. I have so many degrees, I'm a walking thermometer. That can be our God. What we know and what we think we know. And then finally, number five, self-pleasures, self-satisfaction, and pleasing of self. That's probably the number one. And that, 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 uh, that presents itself in the idea, I'm going to do what I want. What pleases me. I don't care about pleasing God. I don't care about pleasing others. I don't care about these things. It's what I want. Matter of fact, the Bible says in the last days that that will be the mantra of society. Men shall be lovers of self more than lovers of God. That's where the fundamental problem with the nation, uh, our cultures and our nations today is we have put us on the top of the heap, not God. Bless him. False gods are what we fashion to take the place of a God that we don't like the way he acts. When we believe that other gods can do better. Then number four, when we can fashion those gods to do what we want them to do. You see here, it says that Aaron took the, took the rings, or the earrings, and he melted them down, and then when he got a, a blob of gold, he began to carve on it. And that God, took, that God took the image of what Aaron thought he wanted his God to be. Okay? Now obviously he was influenced by the people. But it says here, he says that key word, he said he fashioned it uh, the way he wanted it. Folks, that, that is the epitome 
of what a homemade God is. It's a God that you come up in in your mind that says this God's going to be this way and this God's going to be that way and this God's going to respond to me in this way and this God's going to let me do everything I want to do. When I, when I talk to people that don't go to church or don't know Jesus or whatever, uh, it almost, almost without exception comes down to the fact I don't go to church because I don't want anybody telling me what to do. Now, <clears throat> you have a real problem in the world today if you don't want that because there's going to be somebody telling you what to do even though you don't want to hear it. God's going to, yeah, always say, oh, oh, I like God, I like Jesus, and I like love, and I like this, and I like that. But when God starts laying down those laws and rules and regulations and, and uh, commandments, you look at there in Psalm 119, the, the longest chapter, although it be is not really a chapter, but it's a psalm, Psalm 119, 175 verses, only three of them don't mention either God's word, commandments, statutes, judgments, You say, God, does God lay down a bunch of laws? You bet. Amen. You know why? Because He cares. Amen. Right. Because He, that's why they put up road signs so you won't run off the road, so you won't drive off in a, in a, in a valley, so you won't speed and get killed. So you don't, because those are there to warn you, to protect you, to help you, to provide for you. Yeah. We want God and we want everything He can give us, but we want Him to do it without the rules. Well, I'm sorry, that's not the God we have because our God cares. Amen. God knows that He gives you everything you want without any stipulations. You're going to ruin yourself. It always happens that way. It never fails. Even Solomon thought he could control all his wealth and all that. He gave Solomon everything he wanted. What did he do? It just about ruined Solomon. Matter of fact, he came down and wrote a whole book about it. He said life is vanity and vexation of spirit. He said that life's empty. Don't sound like all that stuff is helping him much. God loves you too much to not give you some boundaries. We love boundaries. We don't want to admit it, but we do. I've told you my, my affinity to heights. I love heights. I can sit there here in the valley and watch somebody up on a high mountain and not bother me a bit. <laughs> love it. But when I go up on the mountain, if you've ever been up on Mount Jefferson, you know that there's two overlooks there before you get to the very top. One of the overlooks has no fence. And I mean, right off the edge, it's a... I don't know, five or six hundred foot drop. And I can't imagine what, you know. I fell down, I've fallen off a ladder before. And I couldn't believe the energy I, I created in just that four foot fall. <laughs> I can't imagine what I'd create 500 feet. And, but the other, the other one has some fences, pretty substantial. I mean, they're big old things. Now when I go to the one that doesn't have the fences, I'm like these. <laughs> Only over the edge. Yeah. And then as I get closer, I get a lower risk. And then finally, I crawl over there. Mm, okay. If I go up that one that's got fences, I just, well, hey, hey, all right. I go up and lean my arm on it. I even got up on it one time. That boundary made me feel secure. I knew there was a limitation and I knew where the line was. When I didn't know where the line was, when I did not know that where the place was that I would fall over, that unnerved me. God's boundaries make us feel secure. Amen. Amen. And then finally, <clears throat> these homemade gods that we put up, we... When we choose false gods, we're always led away from the true God. Now, I've heard, I've heard people say, in essence, by, I've heard people say, oh, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to make this change in my life. 
because I think it's going to bring me closer to God. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> You're going to get mad. Go ahead and leave because if you don't want to get mad, go ahead and leave. But whatever you're dreaming and whatever you want to do and whatever you say, uh, you know, I'm going to do this for the glory. Of, remember the glory of God? <coughs> we studied in, in, in Glenn's class this morning. A man who said when we went in, we saw these goodly garments and sheep and everything. And he had been commanded to, to kill and destroy the Amalekites. But he brought back the sheep and brought back a bunch of goodly garments. And he said, oh, but you don't understand. I did it for your glory, God. We brought those back to a sacrifice and worship you. That was Saul. When, when anything, when, when, when we make a false god, it's a false god when it leads us away from the true God. Amen. This job. Mm, I'm surprised. And I, folks, I know we got to work. But if a job is going to take you away from God and lead you away, don't you understand? If a, God, if a job is going to take you away and lead you away from God, I'm not talking about missing a couple of church services, but I'm not talking about fundamentally changing your focus on life. If that job is going to take you away from the presence of God and knowing God and living for God and having Him first in your life, it's a false God. Amen. Mm. Anything that draws us away from the real God is a homemade false God Amen. that we've made in our minds. Bless the Lord. Israel's problem all through the Old Testament was don't you know who I am? Every, every, they, God had to send plague after plague. He had to send enemy after enemy. He had to put them in bondage a half a dozen different times in a half a dozen different places. All with the idea that they would do a couple of things. That they would remember who He was, what He had done for them, and that they would return. Amen. They had to go through this revolving door of believing God, trusting God, getting away from God, being punished by God, being captivated by enemies, and then being delivered over and over and over again. And I see that in people's lives today. Bless them. We never make the same mistake once. Do we? We have a tendency. Listen, here's the thing, and I'll close with this. The devil is a real spiritual entity. Amen. He's not a little imp with a long pointed tail and horns. That guy lives below me down the road, and he's... <laughs> but you know what the devil is? He's very observant. Yeah. Yeah. When he came to God there in heaven, and God said, uh, "You know, hey, look here, well, uh, you know," and and, jo and God and, and Satan said, "But what about Job? Yeah. Oh, you observed him? Yeah, I observe, I observe everybody. I ca I came from walking about the earth to and fro upon the earth, back and forth. What was he doing? He was observing." Oh, you say the devil read my mind. He don't have to read your mind. He can read your steps. He can read your behavior. He can read your lifestyle. He can, re uh, he can read everything you say and do and know who you are and know where you are spiritually and know how to trip you up. He knew Peter was impetuous and, and, and blew, off, blew off at anything and, and, and was just out there away from God's plan. It was Peter's plan. And that's how he knew to trip him up. And Jesus finally had to turn around and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. You do not savor the things of God, but the things of man. Your God 
has never failed you. Romans 8 says, How will he that has given us all things in Jesus Christ not freely give you all things? We look out here and say, all oh, these other false gods can give me so many things. There's so, so much I can get from them. You know, I, I, get, uh, I get happiness and joy and satisfaction and my plans and all this. I get it from all the things that the world offers. And God says, I've got all that. And I have, I have saved you, died for you, blessed you, never failed you. Why do you need another one? You don't. Stick with the real thing. Amen. The moral of the story is when you get up in the morning and spray something under your armpit, make sure it's a deodorant and not shaving cream. Make sure it's the real God. He's going to not fail you. He will not fail you. You don't need to build no fa- you need to You don't need to fashion no new gods. There's only one God. And give him the number one place in your life. Amen. Amen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Bless us in our time of invitation. It's not necessarily time for us to just wear out the carpet and aisle exercise. There's nothing wrong with that. I I invite people to come. This is is the altar. This is the place we dedicated. On the very first service we ever had in this church, uh, going on eight years ago, we said this is God's altar. Everything else is wonderful. Having a having a having a, a wheelchair lift, an elevator is wonderful. Having showers in the bathroom stalls is wonderful. Having this six acres of land, but right here is the place of wonder. Right here, Amen. it's where we do business with God. Now you don't have to do it just here, but that's where this 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 what this is. And as we come today, we. We think about what have I made in my life. We, we all have a tendency sometimes to fashion things and look, look at things in our lives and give them the power that, I, that, that God only has. Oh, that's going to make me happy. That's going to satisfy me. If this, if this happens, if that happens, if, if I can gain this and I can gain that and, and all this, that's going to make me happy. Well, listen, you ought to be saying there's one thing that makes me happy and that's Jesus. And everything else will fall into place. Stand with me, heads bowed and eyes closed. <clears throat> Jacob ran away from, escaped away from his father's laws place and came back with Lee and Rachel. And things just wasn't going too good. He had Esau in front of him, enemies behind. Mm, Looked pretty bad for Jacob and his little band of family. And then he found out there were idols in the tent. Some of his people had bought the idols from where he was over at Laban in that country. And he said, go in and get the idols out. We need to do constant inventory of what we're worshiping and what we're believing in and what we're trusting in and what we're looking to satisfy us and meet our needs. Make sure you're worshiping a God that's worth worshiping. As our pianist or as we play a hymn of invitation today, we invite you to come and Things can creep in. Maybe God ain't answering that prayer you think ought to be answered soon enough. Now maybe the world's things can do that. Maybe maybe God doesn't. I don't understand what God's doing. I don't see more. I, maybe I can't see him. I, you know, Moses went up on the mountain and said, "We can't see him. We don't know what's happened to him." It takes faith to believe God when you can't see him. It's easy to turn and begin to ascribe to something else only the attributes that God has. Nothing, 
nothing works like God works. Nobody is God but God. Make sure you're worshiping the real God, the true God. Not a homemade God you put together to, that, fashion, that you fashion that fits into your plans. Not a God that's going to give me everything I want but has no requirements for me. Doesn't request anything from me. Doesn't command me to be any way. God loves you too much to do that. Here today, you want to join this church? Come join this church. It's easy. Walk down here and say, Preach, I want to join this church. By salvation, by a letter of recommendation from a like church of like faith. Maybe you've never been baptized. That's, a, that's an act of obedience. It's the first act of obedience. It's the first time you have an opportunity to say yes to God or no to God. And sometimes people go for years and say no to God. I don't understand it. But I know this they'll never grow until they take that first step. Maybe you just got a load that you need to unload on God today. Oh, you say, that's all right. I got another God. I got something else I can trust in. Well, good luck. But I know a God who can help you. I know a God who can meet your needs. One more verse. Oh, we'll let that be one verse. <laughs> Give you one more opportunity. So the world has a lot of false gods. And it's real easy to make them. Aaron and them made a calf and said, this is your God. What have you made and said, this is my God? Okay, thank you. Appreciate it so much. Thank you for being here today. Let's, let's focus. God's not going to fail us. A lot of people today are turning to false things in this world because they look at COVID, they look at the Ukrainian invasion, they look at the economy, they look at the political dissent and division in our country and say, well, it's obvious God's not in control. Oh, yes, He is. He is. And uh, if we'll just wait on Him and trust Him, it's like, I, like I've told you before, hang on, good, good things are about to happen. Good news is on the way. I like that song Walt Mill sang years ago. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right, Lord, uh, folks, because Jesus is in control. Thank you for being here today. Let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Everybody, hearts and minds clear. We got, we got our schedule. We kind of got what we're, what we're going here. Deacons, are we meeting today? All right. Diggins are meeting today. Going to bring me a big T-bone. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, uh, let's be dismissed with a word of prayer. Uh, Brother Billy, would you dismiss us?